Welcome to the Stuff and Things Podcast. Your home for all stuff related to your favorite things in entertainment. Now, here are your hosts. Hello everybody and welcome to a new episode of the Stuff and Thangs podcast. I am Sam, talking to you from the UK. Joining me today is a listener to the show, all the way from the great US of A, it's Andy. Welcome. Hey, thanks Sam. Glad to be here. I appreciate you having me on. Hey, you know, you are very welcome. You you were hand-picked from the five people who said they (laughs) want to do it. (laughs) So I made the top five. Yeah, exactly, and that's the best way of looking at it. Yeah, now it's um, I, I put the appeal out last week because I, I think anyone who listens knows that if I'm just talking to myself, I genuinely will start doing voices, and that's not a good way to be, not at all. Um, so I really appreciate you stepping up. Thanks for that. Oh no, for sure. I'm like I said, I'm glad to be here. I've been listening to you guys for years, and so the chance to come yeah. on and you know actually be a part of the show, I, I do appreciate it. Thanks. No, I, well, no, I, I, I feel flattered now. Um, it's The Walking Dead we're talking about today, uh, so it's Walking Dead Wednesday on our show. Um, we are going to be talking about The Walking Dead Season 11, Episode 13. We do have a tradition where I ask the title of the episode, are you ready? I am ready. And the title of the episode is? Uh, this one was called Putin. No, no, I'm sorry, it was <laughs> called Warlords. Warlords was the title. <laughs> The man arrives and starts doing mic drops from minute one. This is this is a good start. Um, so uh, before we get too stuck into the episode, uh, Andy, if you're happy, uh, do you want to do you want to tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and what brings you to the wonderful show that is The Walking Dead? How long you've been watching, etc., and and a little bit like that. Sure. So um, I'm like Sam said. I'm in, I'm in the U.S. I'm in the the southeastern U.S., kind of where the, not where the show is filmed, but the same, you know, geographic area there. Yeah. And been watching the show since since the beginning, um, since, you know, Rick woke up in the hospital, and it seems like it's been forever ago since that happened. <laughs> yep. Uh, and then, yep. you know, been listening to you guys for, like I said, years. I mean, I listened to, and this isn't me blowing smoke, this is the truth now, I listened to a lot of different podcasts where they would review the episode, and you guys were the ones who, you know, I, I tended to vibe with the most there. I'm like, okay, they're yeah. seeing the same thing I'm seeing. They, yeah, they're watching it the same way that I am. So, yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's kind of the thing, isn't it? When you, when you're listening to a podcast or anything, it's kind of, we always equate it and the way we try to do it is, so it's the idea of if you're sat talking about a show with friends. Um, so if you're listening to that and you're listening for that same sort of thing, it's not so much, uh, I mean, I, I don't like going into the over analysis of some things, mm-hmm. um, but I know some people love that, you know, that's really their jam. Um, there are some podcasts I used to listen to and it was so like, uh, this episode, they had, uh, five walkers, uh, three of them were female, you know, it's like, oh, okay, wow. Yeah. I would never have picked up on that, you know? <laughs> right. And uh, Walker number three was also an ep- season two, episode 12. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, I'm a fan, but I'm not, I'm not that level, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I enjoy it and I enjoy talking about it. I, I have found, uh, I don't know about you, but I mean, I, I love the show right at the very start, like season one and season two for me, I've said this on the podcast before, is is for television art as far as I'm concerned. And I've had uh, pits and troughs, you know, some seasons I've liked a lot more than others, some episodes I like more than others. Do you have kind of like a favorite era of the show, uh, you know, along the way, or have you just sort of been consistent the whole way along? So uh, overall, I like the show. Uh, I agree with you that the, f- the first couple of seasons were, you know, by far the best. Uh, and then it yeah. seems like they kind of hit a lag. And for me, when everything shifted uh, was when Negan mm-hmm. came along because he propelled yeah. the story forward the way that nobody else did. Now we're yeah, playing a new fair. game. Now we can't just walk around, spend the whole season walking down train tracks to end up, you know, running into the termites. So, <laughs> you know, to to me, he was the big compelling Reason, And then I think the second part is when, you know, the executive producer, Angela Kang, when she took over, she picked yeah. up the pace quite a bit. Uh, I felt that as well. And yeah, she brought I, I it back. the pace has changed. Yeah, she brought it back kind of to where it was, where it wasn't so much. A whole lot of it to me was wandering in the mm-hmm. desert. I'm like, okay, 
I love the yeah. show, but are we going to do anything before, you know, mid-season break or, you know, yeah. the second to last episode? Because it's like they saved up everything for that. Yeah, it, it did become a little bit, uh, a few people I know uh, sort of came along with a formulaic thing, which is it feels like whenever they meet anybody, they're, they're inevitably going to be a bad guy. So it felt like you'd start the season, oh, you know, we're all doing well, that's good. Oh no, we've met someone new, they're a bad guy. Ah, we have to overcome that. Season ends, we're okay, and, and, and rinse and repeat. So it did, I, I feel like when you said about the sort of Negan character propelling it, it did kind of have that fear element for me, which is this could again become, you know, Governor Mark II. You know, you could easily feel. I, I think the, the hype around the show and the sheer brutality of his entrance uh, mm-hmm. kicked the show forward um, just because it was like, oh, wow, that was that was shocking. You know, that was something else. Uh, it certainly did it for the comics. I mean, I, I never uh, read the comics. I went back over, because um, Alfie, who used to be on the podcast with me, he kind of put them to me and said, you know, you may enjoy these. Mm-hmm. And so I went back over. I, I never bought, I bought the kind of compilation books of them. And so I read the one, uh, which was issue 100, which is where Negan was first introduced. And I read an interview with Robert Kirkman, who literally said he felt the book had become stale. So he needed to do something that would shock people. Because if you get to 100 issues of a comic, people might think, oh, that's a good time to stop. I'm done now. You know, this, I've watched enough of this. Mm-hmm. I've read enough of this. And I feel like with the show, uh, you, you've hit it right. He kind of gave us that shock impact uh, to, to propel the show forward and the story forward. Because it gave a a unifying figure of hatred, if you like, a kind of uh, a master villain, a Darth Vader of the walking dead. <laughs> well, and, uh, and, and it needed it. Yeah. And for me, it was, okay, how are we going to deal with this guy? He has the people, he has the weapons, he has the resources, yeah. you know, we've yeah. not really uh, the governor to a lesser extent, but I feel like the saviors were far more of the big bad. I mean, Negan had outposts. Yeah. He had, you know, no, everything. Yeah. And when he decided, and, and they okay. they were they were far more organized. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the the saviors had a kind of leadership structure. What I find quite interesting as well is once it kind of broke down, and once you you're now kind of looking back on it, you realize that the leadership structure and everything that Negan put in place, he kind of had to be that character he created himself every minute of every day because if he wasn't, he was surrounded by some real assholes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. You know, you think of the the guy who was like his second in command. I'm trying to think of his name. Um, can't think Simon. of his name. We're talking about the actor. Yes, Simon. He was great. The actor who played him had that character nailed, and he was the one who did a lot of the evil savior stuff. Mm-hmm. That you know, Negan's like people are a resource. If I've got ten people that have wronged me, I want to kill one of them because I want nine of them to be, you know, part of this. Whereas Simon was straight up, let's murder everyone yeah. and burn the place to the ground. Let's just kill them all, let God sort them out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That That's one way of dealing with it. Yeah. So, it, yeah, it, it was an interesting time. I mean, like you said about when Andrew Kang came in, I, I think for me, I, I find it difficult because Rick left. Um, I don't know how you feel on that, but for me, I was kind of following the Rick Grimes story. Mm-hmm. And when they, when they made the decision to kill off Carl, which I'm still very bitter about, um, it kind of felt to me that, you know, if Rick had died or Rick had gone, but Carl took it forward, you kind of would have been okay. It kind of would have been like, you know, the, it's continuation. But with Carl gone and then Rick gone, it, it I did struggle initially to get back into it. Um, I, I'm definitely into it again now, but I, I did struggle. How, how were you with that? Because, I mean, obviously you, like me, followed Rick from the start. No, and, and I was the same way. You know, I... I was really disappointed when they lost Rick, but I think that, you know, kind of a behind the scenes, they lost Carl, which I think led to mm-hmm. losing Rick, you know, when yeah. Chandler yeah, Riggs hit 18, the, the, the actors, yeah, mm-hmm, he wanted yeah. to be paid like yeah. an adult and they didn't want to pay yeah. him the adult scale. So he left No, and they wrote him off the show. No. And, you know, yeah. the and Andy Lincoln has kids. He had treated, yeah. you know, I think it was kind of like a stepson to him. And when he saw how they yeah. treated him, he's like, that's enough. I'm gone. Yeah. It was in, it's interesting because that was very much the kind of statement that came out and the kind of word that came out from everybody. What kind of surprised me with hearing that was then he then enlisted himself to do these films. Of course, you know, if they ever appear. 
Uh, but one of the things that I think possibly did happen, you know, you possibly made that decision. He was, I think he was on the fence, but I think like you've just said, he was, as an actor, I think Andrew Lincoln, from everything you see, every interview, he treated that like a family, the cast mm-hmm. like a family. I think he felt very let down by what happened, and so he left. But I think there's a big part of him that just wanted to finish the story. You know, if you've invested that much time, that much energy, and let's face it, that guy gave everything to the performances you know there there are scenes where he's being quite literally emotionally tortured that to this day i'm sort of looking back and i'm like oh wow yeah that's that's painful to watch <laughs> yeah he was um to me he was the highlight of the show and that's not to detract from anybody else that's on it no but no yeah he did he really did a phenomenal job um because when you were following his journey because he did some stuff that was just straight up terrible but because you followed him and you were following his decision making, uh, we used to have the kind of discussion about, um, you know, if you followed Negan from the beginning or you followed other characters from the beginning, would you have the sympathy and etc. And it's possible, but but with Rick, you always felt like even if he did something terrible, he would correct himself because he was trying to do the right thing. Whereas other characters, Negan, for example, he did some terrible stuff to be terrible, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I, I did miss him, but I am happy with where the show is. And this season, I mean, it's the final season, um, and I feel like the show for season eleven, they've not really hit a bum note. Um, each episode has had something which is, you know, really caught my attention. Uh, each episode has kicked the story along, which is, you know, which is one of my main things that I, I want to see. Um, funnily enough. This episode right here does have one of my biggest pet hates in it, though. So, unfortunately, you, you've drawn the short straw with me on this one. You know what, though? <laughs> so, I don't think I did because there was no Eugene in this episode. If I had to watch another uh, hour of him yeah. crying and the way that he talks. And here's the thing. I love Josh McDermott, and I think he does good. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah, right, he's but amazing. Eugene is, is like one of those yeah. spices you have to use sparingly. It adds to it, yeah. but too much of it. Yeah, uh, Stefan agrees with you. Uh, my my normal partner in crime, he yep. he cringe it. I mean, literally, you know, like um, some there are some people their voices hit a pitch or or whatever it is, and it's like nails on a chalkboard mm-hmm. to you. Eugene going on one of his long spieling speeches, I, I can literally watch him sort of cringing. You know, <laughs> it's, it's it's entertaining, but um. With this, my my big pet hate is around storytelling with flashbacks. Uh, um, you, I have that on my list. Show long enough. Oh, yeah, I, you, you've mm-hmm. you've listened to the show long enough to know that I. It's like when it's used sparingly, it's a really great tool for telling a story. But one of my big bugbears is The Walking Dead. Kind of discovered it at one point. Went, oh, that's brilliant. Let's do that again. <laughs> and in this episode, it did for me. Because if you look at the content of the episode throughout it, it was a good episode. There was a lot there, and we'll and we'll go through it in a bit of detail in a moment. But the fact that we kept having one week earlier, one week and one hour earlier, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, really? That's that's not that's not. You literally could have done this episode in order. You know, the events in order, introduced us to the characters in order, and I think the episode would have worked perfectly i don't think it was needed what about yourself no i I completely agree and i I have this in my notes for the show today but i thought if you would have told it in chronological order it would have been better you would have been able to build that tension instead of here's where we're going now let's show you how we got there yeah me too because the, the main the main point for me was when they did the one week and one hour thing we kind of met this character who we just seen um just kind of quickly, this character called Toby. Uh, Toby's having a meeting with our resident kind of sinister man, Hornsby. And he alludes to the fact he's ex-CIA. He alludes to the fact that clearly he's in a position of going out and meeting communities, etc. And he's going to take Aaron, he's going to take Gabriel. He wants them to go to this compound. And he sets him, he's basically setting him on a mission to take the place out. Use them to get inside and do your thing. Uh, anyone who's kind of watched any kind of TV drama or movie over the years, uh, the CIA have a reputation for that sort of thing. <laughs> so it, it's it's interesting. And like you said about if we'd done it in chronological order, we'd have seen this guy. And from the straightaway, we as the audience would have been, oh, no, 
when and we're just going to be waiting for for the moment. The way they tried to do it, I think, was to kind of surprise us. You know, when he snatches the gun and just takes everyone on. Um, but, uh, yeah, for me, if you'd done it chronologically, I think you could have built tension in a very different way. And it could have been it could have been better. But, again, that, that's my preference. I, I just find the time jumps really distracting. Yeah, it's. I agree. I, I, just, I feel like they're overusing it at this point. So, yeah. No, it is is distracting. So I'm going to sort of walk around the episode um, and sort of go through some things. Uh, the first up, we'll start right at the beginning with the cold open to the show, where quite literally a stranger arrives at Hilltop on a horse, uh, blooded. Um, I, I saw a few people uh, say this, and i got to be honest, when I watched it the first time, uh, when I watched the episode, I didn't spot this. But when he arrives, he's blooded. He basically looks just like Rick did when he was riding the horse in his final episode. Uh, because he had that wound. Remember, he'd been impaled? And so the guy riding up to the hilltop, literally sort of the same sort of side, just blood pouring out of him uh, on horseback. Um, I don't know whether that was a deliberate synergy or not, but a few people pointed it out. Um, for for me, I was just kind of like, "Who the hell is this guy?" <laughs> no, and yeah, what's funny is when that guy comes pulling up, I'm like, "Okay, if he lives, uh, Elijah's going to have some competition for Lydia." Oh well, yes, there is that as well. Yeah, the I I did um I, I enjoy little bits like that. I enjoy little bits like that because it's kind of like uh, you're living in this unreal time. You know, the dead are trying to eat you. They've risen, and yet you've still got young people with the hormones raging mm. you know shoot your shot man <laughs> it's just kind of like yeah brilliant you, you know you can literally put young people in any situation and they're still going to try and hook up with yeah. each other which uh bless them <laughs> how would you be young again right <laughs> uh but one of the things that does happen in that beginning bit which i do think is worth us discussing is the fact that lydia's leaving and when she's talking to elijah she kind of uh between them in their conversation they're kind of hinting that a number of people have now left. You know, Maggie made the decision last week in the, the episode last week uh, that they were definitely not going to join up with the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth left behind kind of like a map saying, hey, well, if you, anyone changes their minds, we're here. Mm -hmm. And people are changing their minds. What I mean, as the episode progresses, uh, we can obviously see where, whether we think that was a good decision or not. But... What, what's your opinion? Because I know this is more last week's episode, but what's your opinion on Maggie's decision that she made? You know, I wondered why she was so resistant to it. And I know later on, yeah. you know, when they were in their car, they're talking about, you know, how they tried to, they had offers yeah, of help and they the refused farm. it. To yeah. me, it seems like she's being obstinate for no good reason. And it kind of calls back yeah. to, um, you know, several of the things Negan confronted her on. He's like, you know, we don't yeah. have to plow through this. This could end up very badly. And I think yeah. for a lot of the people at Hilltop, it's like, you know, we're, we're scraping by at best. We're all hungry. You know, it yeah. doesn't have to be this hard. So. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you. And I, I, it's just funny because I don't think when the show was evolving, we or certainly I could never have pictured a point where I'd be looking at a conversation between Maggie and Negan and thinking Negan was making the most sense in a leadership sense, <laughs> you know, it just, but he really was. And he kind of perhaps uh, the, what he's been through in terms of, he was a leader. He was a leader of a very brutal regime. He was very humbled, um, you know, literally in a prison cell for years um, he's come out the other side of that and perhaps he is seeing things clearer because of that uh, because I think uh, from an audience point of view he's certainly speaking for me when he's talking to her right now no absolutely he's he's taking on the voice of the audience and you know yeah. I, I feel like when we first met Negan he was that's not who he really was like you said earlier he's he's yeah. playing a character I think now we see yeah. who he actually is you still see the leadership yeah. qualities and but yeah. you don't see the caricature that was you know Negan yeah, no, I, I agree. It'd be, it's interesting again because he, he appears to have joined up with this group, uh, which we'll come on to. But um, the the fact that Maggie does tell this story about being on the farm um, and and her father and the father's kind of position when they had the drought, 
it does kind of uh, give the impression that she is digging in because, you know, she thinks that's what her father would have done, mm. someone who she clearly looked up to. I mentioned this on the show when I was talking last week, so again, I'd like to bring you in on this. Do you think they're deliberately not referencing Rick much, or do you think that, uh, as in a writing decision, or do you think the characters are simply forgetting the impact that Rick had? Because... Whenever there's a discussion on leadership and decisions, you know, oh, what would so-and-so do, what would so-and-so do, I always think of that as a perfect opportunity where people could say, well, you know, if Rick was here, what would he do? Well, because they are all survivors because of him, really. Well, and they are, but he was so long ago. I mean, how, how many years has it been since anybody's even, you know, how long ago since Rick died? Yeah. And how much have they been yeah. through? So. You know, for them. And no, you, you are right. You are right. I mean, for us as the audience, is uh, you know seasonal. For them, the time jump after Rick, I think, was five years. Was yeah, it? five or six. Um, yeah, five or six years. So yeah, no, you're quite right. And then we've had another jump again. So mm -hmm. we're probably six, seven years since Rick got. No, no, that's fair. But she's there. She's referencing the farm, etc. It was obviously her upbringing. Um, so yeah, and there wasn't anything wrong with that. I just do think to myself sometimes. I wonder if they're kind of holding off Rick references um, because maybe they, they're worried about running into the danger of him being mentioned every week, <laughs> reminding the audience what you could have had, you know, if he was still here. Well, there's that, but, you know, I wonder too, because like with the, the Rick Grimes movies, how many people still care? How long has it been since we've seen Rick Grimes on oh, screen? Oh, man, that's, that is such a valid question. There, um, When we first uh, did the podcast, um, I used to talk to a lot of fellow Walking Dead podcasters all the time um, because we'd all be talking about different things, talking about how, how did you manage to get an interview and things like that and all sorts of wonderful stuff. And um, a lot of them have gone. You know, they've left the show. They kind of hit their point of, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of done. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the biggest ones I used to talk to is called Two Dead Chicks, uh, Two Ladies in Nashville. And they used, I mean, they loved the show. I mean, they'd go to every convention. They'd have their picture taken with every act. You know, they they were obsessed. So when they got to a point that they were kind of, you know what, no, we, we've kind of hit our wall on this. But they put a thing out saying the show will definitely be back with the movies. You know, we're massive Rick Grimes fans. And when Rick Grimes rides again, we'll be back. And I messaged them recently, they were just like, oh, wow, yeah, no, no interest. <laughs> you know, it's gone. And, and like I said, these were people that were at every convention. You mm -hmm. know, at, they were front and center. So if diehard fans like that have lost interest, you've got to believe that unless they can find a way to build that interest back, and by doing that with the show, they're going to struggle, I think, to, to garner the level of interest they're expecting. I mean, you can't... Obviously, you know, the pandemic happened. You, you can No one's responsible for that. But they, before the pandemic, they took a long time to get this rolling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they could have been dropping hints for this for a long time, and they haven't been, which kind of suggests the rumours around the scripts being rewritten constantly are true. Uh, one rumour that is persisting right now, of course, is that Rick Grimes will make an appearance in the final episode. In what capacity, nobody knows, because of course it could be as simple as a flashback. You know, it's the final episode, you could have someone thinking of him and him appearing, you know, like mm -hmm. we did with Shane in Rick's final episode. Uh, but he, is, he has been in Atlanta for quite some time. Uh, he's been seen, spotted. Um, I think that would be their best way of building hype for the film again would be him returning somehow in the final episodes. What about yourself? No, I think that's going to be the only way. My only you know, mm. concern is we're getting down to the last few steps. I know they're, they've got a couple episodes left before they take another yeah. break. Uh, so when they come yeah. back, they've got a handful of episodes and that's it. So if they're going to do that, yeah. you need to start that. Yeah, well, it's it's the final. The final eight has been filmed because uh, Norman Reedus, who plays Daryl, actually got injured in the final episode filming. He had a serious concussion. Uh, thankfully, the news is he's absolutely fine now. But him and one other actor mm -hmm. got hurt, and they were filming the final ever episode in doing that. So uh, we, we we know at least one spoiler. He gets hit in the head. <laughs> we we know that. <laughs> so we'll have to wait and see how, how it happens. Maybe it's Rick. Maybe Rick shows up and just clocks him for leaving him behind. That's how they're going to time in. 
Yeah, you left me on that bridge, you bastard. I was shouting, shoot <laughs> them, not me. <laughs> um, but anyway, so uh, going back to this episode, sort of diving into it again, we saw Maggie doing that, and then we have this moment on the road. She comes across uh, members of the Commonwealth military that have turned, and then we see Aaron running down the road. And it's at this moment you saw a massive eye roll from me, as the screen says, one week earlier. And we go right the way back to Father Gabriel, uh, basically delivering a sermon uh, in a church. When that first happened, were you aware of where he was? Because i got to admit, I thought he was at Alexandria. And I'm looking at all the people going, I know none of these people. Al kind of assumed he was uh, in the Commonwealth because I don't think Alexandria uh, okay. has anything nice left. I don't, no, I, you're, you're probably right, yeah. I don't think they're yeah, changing no, the sign in front of church and people are putting on nice clothes no. there. Yeah, no, no, you, you, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. I think I was just, I was so used to just kind of where they were, where where they are, that I was genuinely looking around the congregation thinking, wow, I, I've really not paid attention to the Alexandrians in some time. There is no one I know. And then, of course, yeah, it became apparent <laughs> where where he was. Um, what One of the things as well, which I quite liked, is uh, Aaron's kind of gone full circle. Uh, when we met him, he was literally working for Alexandria and going out and trying to find people to come in to their wars to help better their community. And here he is again, now for the Commonwealth, doing that same role. One major difference, though, between <laughs> which I did think was kind of funny, is Aaron, when we first meet him and he goes out and meets Rick, very approachable, very uh, polite-looking young man, very kind of, uh, dare I say, down to earth. It didn't look threatening in any way, would you say? Mm. Um, the guy now literally has a uh, spiked mace ball for a hand. I don't think how much he smiles really is going to be relevant anymore. That that guy literally has a weapon for an arm now. Uh, so I, I don't know. What do you think about him being a welcoming wagon capacity? No, I think he's got the right demeanor. And I, he mentions, you know, that he used to work for uh, an NGO. So that yeah. makes sense. So I think, you know, the empathy stuff, like I think he knows how to talk to people. But when you're carrying no, around a, a mace on your arm. <laughs> yeah, and now he's got you so know the full first, beard and everything else. Yeah, uh, yeah. It is. It, it just made me laugh because I was thinking back to it was kind of like this nice reality of oh wow he's he's gone full circle. He's doing what he really enjoyed doing. You know mm -hmm. he, he loved doing that. He he kind of felt like he was making a difference. But then I had this image of imagine being a poor scared community and this guy comes up like you said full beard a weapon for an arm like hey everybody i come in peace do you though <laughs> do you more or less you're not yeah yeah well come in peace shoot to kill as right. as uh, kirk would say um the, the flashback as aspect of it like i said it, it, it irked me but we did get to see uh the guy who showed up at hilltop and the guy's name is jesse um so we knew then the tie-in um, the assumption at this point, obviously, is that uh, Aaron has sent him to Hilltop to try and get help. Uh, so we see that guy, and then we learn again about them going out to this place, this building. When they show up to it, it doesn't look the most inviting place in the world. Um, I think Father Gabriel kind of points out if there's a building out there that basically has Go Away written on it, it's this one. <laughs> um what what what's your thinking? Because there's kind of a debate here between um, our characters that we know and love, Gabriel and Aaron, with the new guy Toby, who we don't know is CIA yet. Um, the debate is about how they go about doing things. What, what's what's your thoughts? Because I mean, when I was looking at, it, I was like, Nah, just walk off. There, <laughs> this this isn't a community you want. This is like walking up the terminus, you know. Just just walk away. Yeah, and. Th approaching a community you never know um mm. but it, it does look foreboding because it's an old you know apartment building or whatever and obviously yeah it's it's run down and everything like that i, I don't know yeah. they it seems to me like they didn't really have any contact they left some mres you don't know the disposition of these people or you no. know are they cannibals we don't know so no no <laughs> these are things i think you would want to know before you just you know kind of walk in their front door um, yeah, I, so I'd agreed with because, them. Hold on. Yeah, I, I was I was with them as well because, and then Toby's kind of pushing it, which obviously we then 
learn why later on. But yeah, the, the kind of the showing up, leaving the troops behind as well. Um, the, the kind of protection aspect. Uh, Father Gabriel decides to remove his collar as well, clearly thinking to himself, I, I don't necessarily you know <laughs> these are religious fanatics. They might not necessarily be uh, fans of priests, <laughs> right. which of course... You know, everyone kind of says, oh, they're religious. Oh, great. Well, they'll obviously like you. There are a lot of different religions out there, a lot of very different beliefs. They could and be... I don't know about you, but <laughs> but in my experience, they don't always get on. No, no. And you could be walking into <laughs> yeah. some snake handling church. or I mean, you just you don't know. <laughs> exactly. You know, Father Gabriel rocks up with the collar and the guys all walk out with like an inverted cross. Oh, right. yeah, not not for me. Okay, yep, okay, no, nope, not not me. <laughs> oh, sorry, you guys are Satanist. I'm sorry. Mistake. Yeah. I'm, I'll <laughs> yeah. go to the next let one. Me, yeah, let, let, me, let me just walk away, please. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of... I liked the debate, though. I liked the fact that we were seeing the experience of our characters. And I think what they did quite cleverly with the show in this is that, from our point of view... We were seeing Toby pushing for it, and we were kind of thinking, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Mm -hmm. You know, this guy is a bit of a fool. This guy is just foolhardy. He should listen to the experienced guys. Uh, Of course, we then learn, once they get inside, of what his true motive was. Now, when they do get up to the place, quite a sinister-looking group. um, Very uh, threatening in their demeanor. Um, they take their weapons, they take them inside, and then they get introduced to the head honcho. Now, I recognize this guy straight away mm-hmm. from, from a famous movie. Did you? Yes, I did. I, I think we have to give a shout-out to Michael Bean. I mean, he's he's yeah. played so many iconic roles. Oh, you know. without a shadow of a doubt, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I loved him in the film Tombstone. Uh, just, just as Oh, that was my favorite, one. yeah. Yeah, well, there you go. He's he's phenomenal in that. Um, absolutely love that film. But for me, I mean, I wrote down in my notes, it's Carl Reese, the original Carl Reese, right? Uh, from the from the Terminator. But here's um, here's the, the problem. Film. Anybody from the Terminator that shows up in front of you know Aaron and Gabriel, that's like kryptonite yeah. to them. Oh yeah, every yeah, cast yeah, member dies. Yeah. <laughs> It's true. This is very true. Yeah, and even even on Fear the Walking Dead, because the John Connor character died in that recent. But anyway, I, I'm really going down a rabbit hole now. I better stop. Right. Uh, but the uh, yeah, I like that. I like the straight away. He's such a great actor, such a brilliant character actor. Because he comes in and straight away he's got you. You know, you straight away. You, we've never met this guy before, but his intensity mm-hmm. when he's sort of shouting at them. Um, pointing out the skulls that he's got on the shelves. It was like, oh, wow, this is this is not a good place. Aaron was right. <laughs> you know, just walk away. Mm-hmm. Um, hey. I, I, at this point, did not see it going the way it then went. Um, what about yourself? I mean, were you suspicious of Toby at all until it was revealed what his mission was? Or were you kind of thinking, like me, he was just a bit of a sniveling, didn't know what he was doing? That is exactly what I thought. And I even wrote in my notes, I'm like, the more I see him, the more I hate him. I thought he was just a sniveling, you know, he's been sheltered, living in the Commonwealth, has no idea how this works. And there again, I wish they told it in chronological order. If we knew that this guy was a, you know, a former spy, then we could see the act he was putting on and be like, oh, this is getting ready to go so sideways. Yeah, well, and that's and that's the interesting thing because I can understand why they decided to hide it because the impact. You know, me and you have seen this episode. We both thought the same thing. This guy is just sheltered, sniveling. You know, what what is he actually going to bring to this other than probably get his head blown off? Mm-hmm. But then the opposite of that is the fact if we as the audience were aware. We'd have just been waiting, you know, it would have been like waiting for the boot to drop, just like, oh, this guy's putting on an act, this guy's going to do something bad, this isn't going to go well. Um, when he does act, he does act fast. This this is someone who is trained. This is not just a survivor who's learned how to use a gun no. over the last decade. This, this is someone who's had training. Um, one of the things I thought they've got really well this season, especially is they have really showed a difference between survivors and firearms and people with training. Because the group of the Reapers that were all ex-military, I thought they they really demonstrated how a group, I think there was about eight to ten of them, Mm -hmm. but they cut through hundreds. You know, Maggie's settlement was hundreds, and they cut through them 
like, gleefully. Like a hot knife through butter. And that, that's what exactly. trained people can do as opposed to, you know, I, I grew up on a farm or I just learned how to do this when the zombies showed yeah. up. Yeah, it's a whole different exactly. level. And, and it is. And I think there's something in the show over the years that perhaps we've not really, you know, we've kind of just taken it on, you know, a bit like there's some, some scenes in all out war and they're like, yeah, okay, this show's just become an action show. <laughs> but initially like seasons one and two, there was a big difference between Rick and Shane and everybody else, you know, Rick and Shane gun handling what they were doing. And, you know, they were police trained mm -hmm. and, and that difference was there and it kind of slipped away. I think what they've done well in season 11 is really brought that back. And in this again, this guy, because they've given us that, because they've given us that with the Reapers, when this guy acts, we all go, oh, wow, yeah, okay, he is, <laughs> he is serious. He is a serious yeah. individual. This guy's full and on also, Jason Bourne, yeah. Exactly, and he leaves the room, and when he leaves the room, you're kind of like, well, what's he going to do? This place is packed. You know, He's got one firearm. Um, it's packed full of people. But then, of course, when the door opens again, we realize that actually, no, an assault team has followed them in. So he coordinated this, he timed it, he knew exactly what his plan was, um, and they literally organised it to go in there and just kill everyone, uh, or just to try and retrieve their property and then kill everybody. Which which brings me to the next question, really, which is, we see a lot with scenes now which are away from them being questioned, just them all looking at each other, where he is asking and others are asking about the guns and this whole thing that's gone missing so there's two points to this the first point is do you think this community actually took anything because none of them appear to be acting like they did no and if if this caravan that they're trying to recover if it had weapons yeah. and things like that i feel like they would have yeah. come into play i mean they were Th that's that's my thinking as well the yeah, people that came out to meet them they were carrying a, a scythe like a grim reaper yeah yeah because i think even um I think Gabriel even says, you know, like, you don't understand me. I'm actually praying you did this right now because we need weapons. <laughs> um, we, we need something. Right. We may live um, if you give them back, but if you don't have them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We're, we're, we're in deep. Yeah. Um, what is so the second aspect to this? I wanted to put to you is when we see this flashback with Toby speaking to Hornsby Hornsby's talking about, you know about my community outreach program and what I'm trying to do. Well, there was this wagon train about that other thing. Did you pick up on that? Or I, is this just something? No, I have that written down. I'm like, what other thing? Yeah. That That's yeah, what I want to know. And why, why are you sending guns and things like that to who? To, to another thing. And now, see, now this, this to me is interesting because me and Stefan have talked a lot about how is this all going to link to... The other, you know, the Fear of the Walking Dead and Rick Grimes was taken by the CRM, not the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. So how how are we ever going to link that in? And I'm just wondering to myself, is there some sort of relationship between the Commonwealth and the Civic Republic? Are there deals being done, you know, weaponry and stuff like that? Is is there some sort of it, and if it is being done, is it being done with everybody being aware? Is this something Hornsby is doing? Is Hornsby there at the behest of somebody else? There are loads of questions, but I'm glad you picked up on it as well, because there's sometimes you hear these things in the show and you kind of latch onto it, but you're mm -hmm. never sure if it was, oh, maybe, maybe that was relevant to something else. But no, and no, I... I yeah, I jumped on that. I thought, well, what, what, where are these guns going? And clearly, it's a big deal. And clearly, he's nervous about people discovering what he's doing because he talks about how he can't send out a full brigade. Mm -hmm. It has to be something covert. Right. So he's he's obviously hiding that. So yeah. it's something I feel like he's doing on his own, or else he could send out yeah. you know, a whole squad or so. Yeah, I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I think the same thing. Which, again, it's one of the things I said about this episode. You know, if it wasn't for the flashback aspect of it, there's a lot in this. There's a lot of kind of this really gives us a clearer picture of Hornsby, um, because I, I've been kind of like unsure about him up to now. Because although he's done a lot of stuff I consider shady, he hasn't to this point for me anyway done something where I feel like he's crossed the line. You know, like with the Eugene situation, yeah, he completely manipulated them to bring them in. But he didn't hurt them. You know, he's not, like, done that and hurt people. He, he's he been manipulative, but not dangerous. 
um, you know, with Carol, he went out to this kind of um, trade negotiation, if you like. When he found out the guy was mistreating people, he's like, okay, arrested mm-hmm. him. He didn't have him shot. So again, it was kind of like, I'm not sure. But in this instance, clearly he does have a darker side and, and an agenda. Um, and I think this episode really forwarded that for us. Um, and I'm really kind of looking forward now to, to what we're going to see. And my question was, and I wrote this down too, is he trying to stage a coup? Is he working you know, with somebody else well, trying to overthrow? Like how many of the, the stormtroopers are in his corner? Yeah. We just don't know. Um, See now that then that that actually is far more interesting from because from my point of view I was kind of thinking of uh, the wider world the CRM but actually a straightforward seizing power mm-hmm. is far more interesting because clearly this guy Toby is completely in his pocket he's clearly got a, a conclave of operatives that he runs that Eugene was kind of investigating. I did wonder if he was doing that at the behest of Pamela Milton, though, because I'm I'm still not entirely sure on her. Um, I I've kind of looked at her as looking a little bit shady herself, but then, you know, in the last episode, uh, she seemed to be sort of when she was talking to Maggie anyway, seemed to be very down to earth and quite talking quite straightforward. She didn't seem to have much of an agenda when she was talking. Uh, look- um, let me tell you my, my but, take on her real quick. Yeah. Um, I feel like she's a politician and you can trust her <laughs> yeah. as much as you trust every other politician. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. So nothing whatsoever. Okay. okay. All right. Good. <laughs> and anyone, anyone who aspires to public office, in my opinion, should automatically be disqualified. That's always been my rule. And that's how I look at her. I'm like, okay, whatever face she's yeah. putting on is just what one serves yeah. the purpose right now. Yeah, what well, it's going to be. I, I like it because it's it's interesting. Because when you get new characters come in, especially in a show like this, which is ten years, you know, we're into the eleventh season and final season, it can be very easy for new characters to, in essence, just be talking props. Mm-hmm. You know, just not really have much to them. But I feel that Hornsby and Milton, especially. They're they're really interesting. Like they've really captured me. Like I'm trying to work out what their goals are. Um, I don't know if they're aligned. I don't know if they're actually working against each other. And and I'm enjoying that. I'm enjoying the aspect of finding out each episode, trying to piece it together. But right now, if I'm going to throw a theory out there, I think I like what you said then. I think perhaps he's trying to seize power. And perhaps that involves, you know, outposts getting guns and Mm -hmm. certain people. And, you know he's reaching out to these other communities. Perhaps he's hoping to build a power base where these communities are loyal to him because of what he's done. Or perhaps he's looking to have, in essence, a staging area for his own army. Mm -hmm. I I mean, I don't know. Uh, What about yourself? What do you think about the dynamic? And do you think they're together? Do you think they're at at odds? I, I really feel like he's way too ambitious. I think he is... He plays along for right now, but I feel yeah. like he's too, he's way too ambitious. And then I've seen her, you know, ad- dress him down and just talk down yeah. to him when he, when he got the wine, when Carol got the wine and he's like, Hey, how do yes. you like it? She's like, oh, that's fine. That's not yeah, something you no, do to your partner or your cohort, your right hand no. man. Yeah. No, that's no, that, again. Yeah, you're right. She, and she seems to do it publicly as well. And that was, because there was, yep. which is, which is where the problem is now. Th- What I find interesting, because in that very episode where she does speak down to him, she does really demean him in public, she does also have a moment where the guy shouts, there are hundreds of us who feel this way, and she just kind of whispers to him, really? And he goes, I'll find out. Which kind of smacks to me of she knows who he is and what he is. Um, And, you know, maybe he's the master of whisperers for her, you know? It's just kind of... I don't know. It's it's an interesting dynamic because, like you, I kind of think there's definitely a tension there and definitely a a power vacuum, perhaps, uh, going to be exploited. But she, at the same time, did immediately turn to him to go and find out information. But maybe again, she's mistrusting him. I think um, she is. I think we're going to find out that when when Rosita uh, went through and she found all of that propaganda material and resist the Commonwealth. Yes. I feel like he's yeah. behind that. I may be wrong. But right oh, now, that, well, that well, no, because again, that 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 would kind of track. You know, he's meeting, having secret meetings uh, with people, which Eugene. It's it's interesting because we're getting lots of different pieces from different angles, um, and it's just trying to build the picture. Uh, 
Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll have to work out. Um, like like we said, uh, Carl Reese doesn't last that long. Toby takes him out. Toby appears to quite like violence. Um, from a kind of a snivelly character at the beginning of the episode, by the end, he seems to actually quite enjoy killing people. Um, he, he seems to really, yeah, really enjoy it. Um, we have a situation where he's actually throwing people off a roof as well. Which the thing I really liked about that is we just heard the scream and the noise. Because my imagination can do so much worse than what any special effect can. And sometimes when you see special effects in shows, it's a bit like, oh no, that yeah, that looks that looks very CGI. Because obviously they're not really throwing people right. to their deaths. But but I, I, I kind of find the scene where uh, Negan, etc. are in the building, you just hear the people shouting and dropping. It's kind of far more menacing like that. So what's funny... That same scene, I didn't take it as menacing. I was trying not to laugh because it, they, they were in the middle of their dialogue. And you're just like, ah, splat, yeah. ah, splat. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, no, you definitely can. I mean, it does remind me of the game Lemmings, of course. Right. You know, you, you can put the Lemmings soundtrack over that and just have a, have a laugh. Um, but, uh, of course, we have to now talk about Negan um, because Negan does come into this. Uh, there's a scene where uh, Father Gabriel is in trouble. Uh, he's been taken because he, he basically punches Toby, which, by the way, I'm, I'm really liking Father Gabriel's newfound uh, violent, angry streak. Um, you know, God's talking to him again, but he's still throwing punches. Fair right. It, it's the Old Testament God that's talking to yeah, him. Yeah, definitely. Definitely gone old school. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, but he, he does that. He, I mean, he's obviously in deep trouble, but Negan appears. Negan, uh, we first see him meeting that Jesse guy uh, who's stealing a horse, um, and it's Negan who sends him to Hilltop. Uh, tell tell these people that, you know, Aaron, uh, etc., and Gabe are in trouble. Go. We then see him go in. So Negan has obviously become part of this community. Um, he even, uh, there's a, a lady there he's with who he seems to be sort of out, you obviously doing like a run with or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says to her, like, we've lost our best people. I'm, I'm guessing he means his best fighters. Um, so he's, uh, he's obviously been there a while now. We did get a kind of six month jump from when he walked away from Maggie. So, but because they've jumped around the time so much, I'm guessing this is months in because, the six-month jump was Daryl at the gates of Hilltop, which we've not got to yet. So I'm just guessing we're a few months down the line from Negan walking away. So he's obviously been with these people a little while. But at the same time, he, he seems almost like a completely different guy. Like, laid back, happy, chatting. <laughs> just, and they all seem to like him. Well, uh, I know, think... if, they, if they knew him, they'd be more nervous. Well, and I think now he can just be a part of something instead of having to lead something. He doesn't have to, you know, be anybody other yeah. than who he is. He can be that laid back and just, you know, but yeah. the the time jumping thing, I was like, okay, wait a minute. He walked away and I guess just showed up here the next day. Yeah. The time no, jump. No, it's, it, they time, it is confusing. It is. It, Doctor Who is easier to follow with, with the time stream than this. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, yeah. No, probably. Um, it is, it is, yeah, it is a bit aggravating, but I'm sort of trying to keep it, sort of trying to keep it together. So he is there, he is part of the new group. He does save Gabriel and, uh, hey Gabe, which made me laugh. Um, Aaron does get away. Um, so in essence, this building now has got Negan and this group of people with Gabriel, uh, these group of people we've not really seen before. They're in essence trying to fend off the Commonwealth soldiers and this guy Toby, who's now in full military uniform, ready to fight. Um, so he's storming their way down there, and and the episode basically ends with the strike team of Elijah, Lydia, Aaron, and Maggie arriving. Um, and and then I don't know about you, but I find the end of the episode a little bit like, oh really? <laughs> you know, this you're literally leaving us on that. Um, but I, what what are your thoughts? What what are you? I mean, I really hope the next episode continues because if the next episode jumps us to something completely different, I'm gonna be pissed. Okay, uh, can I tell you if it cuts back to Eugene? Yeah, I'm gonna lose my mind. I, I don't think I don't think I'll own a TV if that happens because I'm gonna throw it. Across, yeah. I'm gonna pull it off the wall and throw it. Um, yeah, I uh, hope episode, it picks up. Uh, episode 14 is titled "The Eugene Monologues," where he basically talks about his book for 51 minutes and, and cries. <laughs> 
and it's just <laughs> way oh, yeah, over emotional. Yeah, yeah, don't do that. So I'm, I'm hoping with, I'm like you, I hope it picks up where we left off. But yeah. here's the thing you've got, you know, these trained people going up against, yeah. you know, Spike Arm and Maggie. And I don't know yeah. if that's a strike team. I, I mean, they, oh no! I, I they was can saying help, it very but... tongue. I was no, saying no, no. Yeah, it very sure. tongue in cheek. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, um, I, if that's if that's Rick and Daryl walking in there, you think, yeah, okay, that's that's gonna even it up a little bit. Um, but yeah, I'm not thinking of Lydia uh, and Aaron. I mean, don't get me wrong, Aaron, a smash a few of that armor with his arm. Uh, Maggie doesn't really take many prisoners. Uh, Lydia's kind of a bit unproven. Elijah, I think, uh, a little bit still unproven, um, and up against, like you say, trained individuals. What? what it's it's going to be interesting anyway, because of course the, the lady who's with uh, Negan, she basically tries to inspire the people that are there. Like you know, they're on our turf. They don't know this building. We do. We've got an advantage. Um, it does kind of, again, it just kind of alludes to the fact they haven't hijacked anything. They've not taken anything. So does that mean they've been blamed? Has someone actively set them up? And or is there perhaps someone there who's done something a bit rogue? Well and a lot don't know about it. I'm wondering was it does it have anything to do with this group at all, or did somebody completely unrelated ambush that yeah. convoy, take their stuff, and they're just taking the, the blame for it? Yeah. Like, I mean that that's that to me seems far more likely because like Gabe says, you know, right now I'm praying you've got this stuff. Mm -hmm. At this point, you'd be breaking out the weapons, wouldn't you? You, you wouldn't right. be, you wouldn't be trying to maintain your innocence. You know, if you were thinking, if we all just say we don't know anything about it, maybe they'll leave. The fact they're throwing people off the top of the building, you've shot your leader. You should surely now be under no illusions that this group's leaving you alive. Right. If I took the stuff, I'm going to be like, okay, guys, sorry, but here, have a gun exactly yeah yeah sorry about this but you know yeah. <laughs> it's time to tool up um one of the final aspects i want to bring up and, and by the way I'll, uh, if you've got any other notes as well I'll, I'll bring that in next but one of the final aspects i want to bring up is kind of like what happens now with the relationship with the commonwealth clearly this is now concreted in maggie's mind her opinion of the commonwealth mm -hmm. but aaron and gabe are literally citizens now they have roles they have jobs within the commonwealth if this Toby guy and the troopers get back, then Hornsby, etc., is going to know that they're, they're a threat to him then. So it's almost like they can't let any of these guys leave. They, they can't. And then if they don't let them leave, what happens when they go back? You know, Hornsby is going to wonder, well, where's all the men that went with you? Where's, where's my guy? Um, I don't see any scenario here where the relationship manages to keep a status quo. I, I think... This act in this scene and what has happened in this episode is a big problem for all of them. Well, this this is my thought. This is how I think I think it'll play out. Um, Hornsby could always make the argument that look, we try to bring people in. Oh, yeah. Not everybody's good. Not everybody's going to be able to go back to being civilized. A lot of people have gone feral. That's what we had yeah. here. So we did that before they came after you know one of our convoys or you know something like yeah. that. So it was preventative maintenance so to speak do you think he do you think if aaron and that came back angry about what happened hornsby would just try and spin it i, I absolutely think he would do them exactly yeah. like he did eugene like yeah it was ugly i get it yeah. but you know we're, we're trying to protect fifty thousand people and we can't have you know stuff like that yeah so well, you i mean it could be a perfect way of us as the audience gauging where Pamela Milton is, you know, these guys come storming back, demand to see Pamela Milton, Hornsby comes in and you get the two of them in the same meeting, you know, she could be shocked and, oh, what have you done? You're a terrible man. They all leave the room and then she turns to him and they're like, well done, you know, don't leave any witnesses. You know, right. we'd be like, oh, she is in on it <laughs> all along. Oh, damn it. Yeah. Um, did you have any other, did you have anything else from your notes that you wanted to cover about the episode? The only other thing that I had um well this may be kind of a spoiler if you haven't heard but it's all over the internet. You know there's a Negan yeah. and Maggie spin-off. Yes, there is. Yeah. yeah. So that that's a little bit on my nerve because you keep taking pieces off the board. So now we've got yeah. four people with plot armor. Yep. Um I have a concern for how many loose ends they're going to leave. Uh, my fear yeah. is that it ends up like a Game of Thrones type ending, God forbid, where they're just yeah. where they're teleporting and just lurching and leaping forward, where it stopped making sense, and we're just trying to wrap it up. 
Yeah, no, that 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 is a fear. Uh, that because for me it feels like the Walking Dead as the main show deserves an ending. It mm-hmm. deserves a kind of even if that ending is a kind of uh, you know I I I was laughing at like the eighties movie ending where you just get like a freeze frame and so and so lived happily here, so and so lived happy, you know, so and so did this, so and so did that. The fact that we have the spin offs suggests that we're not going to get that. It suggests that there is a problem. You know, Daryl and Carol go off together. So clearly the Commonwealth falls. Or clearly they don't, they're not longer a part of it. We know that Maggie and Negan end up in New York. You know, so so what's happened there? We, is New York uh, a place that's run by anybody? Is that part of the Commonwealth? Part of the CRM? You know, we have no idea at this stage. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, personally, the massive, massive, densely populated cities to me is just like hell no. <laughs> you right. You do not want to go there. Well, you saw it was you in know, Atlanta. We, we saw it. Yeah. Exactly. We saw Atlanta. And, you know, it's just like you do not set up shop there at all. That that would be crazy. Um, I always liked the um, – there was this uh, book idea. So Robert Kirkman, uh, one of the other writers for The Walking Dead – he always had this idea of introducing to the comic book uh, a British character because he thought it would be funny if, um, because obviously Andrew Lincoln's a Brit playing an American, he always liked the idea of they'd introduce a British character and they'd want an American to play him on the show. <laughs> they, they, it was like a stupid thing. And he said they had this idea of this character who was a British uh, army soldier who escorted some diplomat to the US. The world fell apart and all he wanted to do was get home. But he had no, you know, planes aren't flying, nothing's going on. So he literally is walking like a kind of kung fu star. I walk the <laughs> earth going from place to place all the way across the states to try and get to the East Coast, to get to New York, to find a boat. You know, just this guy's just one track minded. Um, and they said, like, we had this whole thing worked out. We had this whole idea for him. And it was it was possibly just going to be his own book for a while. Uh, he said, and then it just got to the point that, you know, Robert decided actually we're going to end it. You know, we're going to end the book. And so it, so it never happened. But I was kind of, I was like the idea of this one character just being completely driven with the idea of finding a boat to try and sail from New York to England. Like, like, like it was, like it would be nothing, you know, that, <laughs> just like. That's, that's a, that's a job to get across. The... You know, yeah. Yeah. Just, I mean, you know, get, get the oars out. I'll row the first right. bit. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck, my friend. Um, there is, of course. I mean, do you watch the spinoff show? Do you watch Fear the Walking Dead? Okay, so I gave up on Fear uh, several years ago. It was okay. It was bad for me. I, I couldn't. Yeah. I wanted to, and especially when they sent Morgan over there, which I feel like was a yeah. big a big loss to the main show. But they sent him it over was, there, yeah. and he was just Momo, and he was. I don't know. It. it I. Yeah, I just no, they, couldn't. Um, I, I it has improved. I will say that, it has, but there okay. is, it is it is it is a tonally different show. So you know, some people can't get to it, and that's fine. But there's actually now a spin-off of that coming as well, and the actual premise of this spin-off could be pretty frightening. Could be actually quite a good horror show. Um, so in uh, the, the the season before the one we're on, so season six of Fear, a nuclear submarine has beached itself where they are. Oh wow! Um, and they they use it as a base for a while. You know this this nuclear sub before they realize that the reactor and possibly some of the warheads are leaking. So you know you don't want to be there. Yeah. So I'm not going to talk about too much of that storyline. But they're actually going to do a prequel uh, offshoot of this nuclear sub when the world falls. So on a submarine under the water and people are turning. I, I think that sounds terrifying. <laughs> it does, and that would be worth watching, and that's what I'd hope yeah. fear would be. I wanted I'm, to see the gradual breakdown you. of society. You know, I wanted to oh, see... Oh, man, we, we, we discussed that so much when we were watching it. We were like... We felt like they kind of... They had the idea, and then they bottled it. It felt mm-hmm. like they had the idea, and then rather than sticking with that, they decided they were going to race to get it to being like Walking Dead... Miami, you know, right. just like an offshoot, just in a different place. But I wanted it to stay right at the beginning, which is what Robert Kirkman wanted. That was his whole premise behind that. If we're going to do a spin off, let's do this. Let's have it set where everything, because the first few episodes of the show was great because we, the audience knew what was coming and nobody else did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was, and you're like, you'd see a guy walking down the road ambling, you'd be like, oh, here we go. Here we go. Oh no, he's drunk. Okay, all right. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, it, like Shaun of the Dead. It, yeah, I love that. Love that film. Oh yeah. Um, 
Yeah, that's that's right up my alley, that one. Um, so Yeah, so that as a spin-off for A Fear of the Walking Dead sounds terrifying. I love the idea. I, I think that's... Uh, I think that's going to be great, and it's actually coming out very soon. Uh, I think it's uh, towards the end of April. Um, so, uh, Fear the Walking Dead resumes its seventh season when The Walking Dead uh, takes its next break, final break. Um, and then, so we'll be talking about that on the podcast as well. So, if you do, uh, if you do look for it, you can find it. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll watch that one as well. Uh, but Andy, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank yeah. you so much for stepping in. Um, Absolutely. Would you be willing to come on and get in the future and talk about all sorts of shows with us? Yeah, anytime. Just let me know and I will absolutely be here. Oh man, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, big thank you to everybody for listening. I hope you've really enjoyed it. If you'd ever like to come on the show with us, you have to apply and you have to be far nicer than Andy because <laughs> Andy's A1. Andy won. <laughs> He's top, top number one. Uh, thank you everybody for listening. We'll be back next week where we're talking about episode 14 of season 11. Uh, if you're a fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, you're a fan of Star Wars, keep an eye on our Facebook page. There's a lot of content being announced over the next few days. It would appear that the Marvel Netflix shows, Daredevil, Jessica Jones, etc., now on Disney+, Plus are all about to get renewed. They're all about to have new series announced. So if you like them, keep an eye out for those announcements. We'll be talking about them on the show. Until then, everybody, you take care. Andy, you want to say goodbye to the people? Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the Stuff and Things podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. You can find us on Facebook or online. Simply search the Stuff and Things podcast to join in our conversation every week.